Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome. I would like to introduce uh, Chris uh, Schulz, uh, the CTO of uh, Total Child Health, uh, where he leads a small team of uh, engineers to build server-side healthcare-related uh, healthcare, uh, related software in Java. Chris is an active member of the Apache Tomcat and Velocity communities, as well as the committer of both projects. He has attended several Apache cons, and he helped organize the previous uh, Apache bar camp in Washington. Uh, please welcome Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Make sure the mic is working. You guys can hear me. You probably can hear me whether the mic is on or not. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, monitoring Tomcat with JMX. Uh, there are not very many options when it comes to monitoring Java virtual machines and Tomcat in general. Uh, JMX is a natural choice. So I'm not really going to discuss other options uh, for doing that kind of thing. Um, I'll go ahead and uh, uh, not bother telling you a whole lot about me. The introduction was pretty, pretty good. Uh, I've been part of the Tomcat community, though, for about 10 years. Uh, and I realized during Mark's presentation earlier that uh, that's about how long he's been involved. But uh, somehow he has done anything and everything in the ASF, and, and I haven't. So I think I need to start working harder. <laughs> So um, we're going to do an introduction, uh, an introduction to monitoring. Uh, nothing I'm going to present is going to be really earth shattering or complicated. The idea is to give everyone here an idea of how you can start doing monitoring if you're not doing it already, or maybe expand what you're doing uh, that you may have already started. So I'm not going to also bother talking about why monitoring is a good idea. Uh, anybody who is not sure why they would want to know about the internal state of their Application servers? No. Okay, good. Okay, so um, <clears throat> JMX itself is uh, an API and protocol for monitoring um, and managing JVM processes. Everything is done with these things called M beans, management beans. Uh, they include rewrite operations, um, or sorry, re read and write attributes, so you can find out the state of things, and you can sometimes modify the state through that. Uh, and then you can also invoke operations, which are orthogonal to those attributes. You can receive notifications. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit today, uh, but I won't show you how to actually register for listening for those notifications. Um, and both Tomcat and the JVM uh, expose lots of information through these JMX beans. Uh, the JVM exposes actually quite a bit of stuff you'll see a little bit later. Um, these are some of the kinds of interesting things that you might want to take a look at when you're first starting out. Uh, you can get sort of arbitrarily complex uh, as, as your dive into the JVM gets, uh, uh, gets deeper. Uh, and Tomcat has a lot of information uh, available as well. Here are some examples that we're going to dive into a little bit deeper, uh, a little bit deeper later. Uh, so I mentioned that JMX is both a protocol and an API. Good news is you don't need to know anything about the protocol and you don't need to know anything about the API if you just want to go in and take a look. Because there are a bunch of tools already that are free and easily available. Uh, if you've installed the JDK, which I'm guessing 90% or more of you have done, you have both JConsole and JVisual VM. Uh, there's a non-packaged version of Visual VM, which that's where all my screenshots come from. Uh, which tends to be a little bit more up to date than the one that they throw out inside the, uh, the JDK download. Uh, and then also most profiling tools include a uh, component that's able to do remote connections and take a look at uh, JMX properties and things like that. So there's no shortage of tools that you can use with this right out of the box. And again, you don't have to understand the APIs or the protocols to use them. Oh, and you can always write your own tools if you really feel like it. So uh, if you want to dive into the APIs and the protocols, you can you can do that kind of thing. So here's an example of what uh, the JVM is exposing to you. Um, we'll get to this Catalina stuff later. That's all the Tomcat stuff. Java.lang has a number of different uh, mbeans that you can inspect. And uh, what I've decided to do is just grab the memory mbean. I'm trying to make sure I don't get in your guys' way here too much. Um, I'm, I've expanded the heap usage, the heap memory usage. Uh, there's this thing called the composite, com composite data support, which is basically like a hash of uh, or a hash table of stuff. So it'll tell you what's the initial value, the max value, the uh, use value for the number of bytes that are currently in use for the heap memory. Down here, there's non-heap memory. I've chosen not to expand that, just so that you can see um, that if you were to pull this up yourself, 
you would see two lines that look like this. All you got to do is double click on this thing and it expands it and shows you all those things. That hash uh, actually isn't just name value pairs, it's name and like a really complicated value. So if you wanted to write your own tool to inspect this thing, you could go in and say, I'm looking at heap memory usage. Uh, what is in there? What types of values are in there? What are their names? And what Java native type are they? So these would all say long values, for instance. So I've expanded the Catalina uh, or the Tomcat uh, tree from the previous slide. And you can see there are quite a few, uh, not only mBeans themselves, but uh, actual subtrees uh, of stuff that's available. Uh, it actually looks more complicated than what the JVM provides out of the box. Uh, and I kind of think that's probably accurate. Uh, I have not gone through and inspected every single thing that the JVM exposes to you. Um, but, uh, but the Tomcat folks have gone to great length in order to expose all these types of information uh, to you. So um, a lot of this information is just configuration. So for instance, if you wanted to inspect a connector and find out what was going on in there, you might think, well, let me just go and start up here at the connector. Uh, unfortunately, the connector mbean just tells you about the configuration. It'll tell you like what protocol it's using. And you should know that already. Um, so what I've done here is uh, called out the, uh, the different subtrees that you want to look at if you want to look at, for instance, session information comes from the manager. Uh, if, you didn't, if you've never set that up yourself, you might not know that session and manager are uh, related. Uh, request com performance can come from the global request processor. Uh, the request processor threads come from the executors, not the connectors. And, uh, and data sources, that actually kind of matches up, which is nice. Uh, so I'm going to cover, I'm going to dive into each of these things, and I'm going to do them in a little bit out of order uh, because they're sorted alphabetically on this page. I just wanted to uh, uh, call them out that way. But instead, I'm going to start with request performance because I think that's the easiest one to understand. Um, so Tomcat tracks the performance of requests in aggregate for each of the connectors separately. And it does that via these global request processors. So here is a view of one of the global request processors. I have expanded this tree and selected one essentially at random because that's the one that I intended to use. I've got three of them configured there. Uh, and what's kind of nice is that just looking at the name, you can tell exactly which connector it is. You don't have to give these things names and remember what they were. You know that these two are using the HTTP protocol. They are using the, uh, the NIO strategy. And uh, these are the port numbers, 8215, 8217, 9876 uh, 98, for some reason. Um, and uh, the one in the middle here, 127.0.0.1, that one has been bound to a specific interface. So you can get a lot of information just by looking at the name of the thing. Uh, the global request processors keep track of metrics about the requests. So uh, looks like I made a bunch of requests and didn't actually post any information. But what you can see here is this is the total number of bytes sent, big lot, and the, uh, total, the maximum amount of time in milliseconds that it took to process any one request. So for all those bytes, uh, maximum time was uh, relatively short. And uh, this is the number of requests that I actually submitted or uh, made. Uh, and then this is the total processing time. So uh, I mentioned earlier that mBeans can have uh, not only attributes, but operations. This mBean exposes an operation called reset counters, which you may guess resets the counters. And if I uh, back up a little bit, just so you can see, those were the uh, uh, those were all the metrics before, and then once I invoke that operation, uh, they all go to zero. So that's not terribly uh, surprising, but it's nice that you can reset those values so that you could watch them over time, and then say you want to kill it off once every hour. So for instance, uh, you might want to know it's the maximum time it took to do a request, uh, but after a day or two, it doesn't matter what happened yesterday, so you want to reset all of those things and start over again. So session information is obviously another thing that you might want to keep track of. Um, the real problem is not the sessions, it's the data in the sessions. But uh, it's quite easy to find out how many sessions are live and, and what the, uh, uh, 
uh, what the create and, and expiration rate is. So a couple of interesting things that are in here. First of all, I expanded the manager. Uh, every web app that I have deployed shows up separately because sessions are web app specific. So in, in this case, I've, done, uh, I've selected the examples to take a look. There are no active sessions. Uh, that's the one listed at the very top if you guys can't read it. Um, and then here's the, the max active. This is the maximum number of sessions that have been active at a particular time. Um, and uh, then there's max active sessions. It's a little, I, I'm not sure why these are named the way that they are, but max active sessions is the limit of sessions that Tomcat is willing to allow. It's negative one, so it sky's the limit. Um, and max active is, is not a maximum that may be active. It is the maximum that have ever been active. Um, let me see, is there anything else on there? There's an X, yeah, this, this is interesting too. Session expire rate and the session create rate. You might want to keep a, an eye on that kind of thing to see if somebody is just pounding on your login page and creating sessions that have no particular use and they're all going to sit around for God knows how long. The default's going to be 30 minutes by the time uh, those sessions go away. So um, Tomcat has, did I put them in here? Nope. Um, Tomcat has uh, exposed for the, the session manager operations that allow you to do all kinds of interesting things. Um, you can get a list of all the session IDs. You can fetch an attribute value. Uh, and we're gonna, I'm going to show you some of those things a little bit later. Um, OK, most people. Maybe not most. Many web applications have JND or uh, JDBC data sources. You want to keep track of your pool and find out whether or not it's performing uh, appropriately. Uh, Tomcat's data sources have a, a connection pool, as you might imagine, with minimum maximum sizes and an idle setting, which allows the pool to grow and shrink to meet the demand. And so you can see all of those things in here. Um, this is the number of idle session, or uh, I'm sorry, this is the number of idle connections, num active is zero. I happened to take the screenshot while I wasn't running a load test of any kind. Um, and uh, max idle and max total are, are there. You should probably know what a lot of those values are beforehand, uh, but being able to inspect them at runtime is very useful. Um, and note that I have, uh, I'll just put a plug in here, I have max active set to one because this is not a production machine. And uh, I'll, if you, as anybody is interested in why, you think, uh, why I think you should do that, please come talk to me after the talk. Um, so also, uh, each of Tomcat's connectors has a thread pool that's used to actually dispatch the requests. And uh, in Tomcat, those connection or uh, uh, those thread pools are called executors. And they can be shared between connectors, which is why they are shown separately from the connector configuration inside of JMX. Um, Executors are a lot like the JDBC connection pools in that they have the minimum and maximum in the idle. Um, there's a bit less information uh, about it here, but uh, you can find how many uh, spare threads are waiting around for work to do, how many threads you're willing to spin up, and how many are active. So right now, none are active. And uh, what I decided to do was uh, put a little bit of load on the server and take another screenshot. So you can see the active count, the number of threads are actually checked out of the pool and doing something is now six. I'm not sure why the core pool size says it's four. I believe that's because um, two of those threads will be retired relatively quickly uh, once they are no longer used. Um, but uh, the, the, actually, the pool size itself, the number of threads that are actually there is 21 right now. So these are all values that you might, you might want to take a look at while your uh, server is running to make sure that uh, you're not experiencing some really wild, unexpected spike. So I put a little bit more load on. Uh, nice job. Got the tool tip in the screenshot. Um, the active count has now gone up to 12. And uh, something else that the executor keeps track of is the number of tasks that have completed. So uh, if I back up a little bit, you'll see that second number there. It's is going up by quite a bit as I run my, my load test. If you're not interested in uh, writing down the values of active count uh, every five seconds or however often this thing updates itself, 
you can double click on the value and Visual VM will then chart it over time for you. So Tomcat and JVM monitoring is all well and good, but what if you want to inspect something in your own application? Well, it turns out that um, you can uh, expose your own information via mBeans just uh, relatively easily. So let's peek under the covers and see how that, how that works. So the nice part about using mBeans is you can use all the tools that I've talked about thus far and actually I'm going to show you some tools later that you'll be able to use as well. So if you're interested in uh, monitoring your own applications, this is a good way to do it. So uh, I'm going to give you an example of uh, an mBean here. And I'll write from scratch. Uh, rather than bore you with every single line of code, I'm going to give you samples. So Tomcat provides a request processing metric mBean that is uh, tracked on a per servlet basis. So if you have five servlets, you'll get five different sets of metrics. Uh, lots of us run things like Spring or Struts where there's one big fat servlet that does everything. And so if you have requests that take a long time, you have requests that take a short amount of time, all those metrics get jumbled in together. You kind of can't really make head or tail of them. So I'm going to write a filter that you can map, as an example here, uh, a filter that you can map to an arbitrary URL pattern, and it will track, the similar, they will track similar metrics for just that URL pattern. And you can deploy it as many times as you want and uh, uh, call them whatever you want and get lots of different metrics. So here's some code. <laughs> um, sorry, it's a little messy. But uh, for Tomcat's mBean server implementation, we need an interface. That's this. And the implementation here. Um, actually, don't worry too much about the implementation. Uh, but the point is I'm going to have two attributes that are read only, get processing time, get request count, and an operation which will allow you to reset those counters just like we saw before. Uh, I'd like to point out that I'm using atomic long objects. I didn't show the declaration in here. But you can see total elapsed time I do to add and get. Um, this is going to be used in a multi-threaded context. So we have to be sure and not trip over ourselves. We also need an mBean descriptor, which is an XML blob which describes all the operations. Um, you can describe things as either operations or attributes. Uh, and for whatever reason, I chose to describe them all as operations, even though the processing time and the request count are really more like attributes. It actually turns out it doesn't matter how you do it. Uh, the mBean server kind of figures it out and just does the right thing. Um, I have found that you don't actually need the descriptor. Um, but you should use a descriptor <laughs> because it allows you to document all of the parts of your mBean. When you connect with something like JConsole or uh, your profiler, it will tell you about all the attributes. Instead of just giving you their names and values, you can go in and say, well, what is, click on this thing and give me more information, and it'll give you all the metadata associated with it. This is where that metadata comes from. Is that, yes, that's actually what the tooltip was. So actually, uh, that was... That was me being, you know, helpful. <laughs> exactly, foreshadowing, exactly. Um, so what did I do here? Descriptor. All right, so next step is to jar all that stuff up and drop it into Tomcat's lib directory. You cannot deploy this with your web application or if you can, I actually did not try. But if you, if you could do it, anytime you reloaded your application, you would leak a class loader, which is a bad thing. So I'm just going to say, put it in Tomcat's lib directory. Yes? Uh, if you use the common or the shared loader, that would probably work. Um, if you're going to do that, you may as well just throw it in the lib directory anyway. There, you, you get really no advantage for putting it one versus another. Oh, absolutely. So yes, to, to keep Tomcat's lib directory clean, that might be a, 
a good strategy. So now I need the actual filter code, which is going to capture the data and publish the mbean to the server. So in my init method, uh, I'm going to call the magic get server method, which you can look up in the, in the code, which is going to be published with the, the slides. Um, it's actually not that complicated. It's like four lines of code. It's mostly error checking. Uh, and then I'm going to register my mbean, which is this uh, st underscore stats thing, um, with this name. And I'm using a filter name right here because I want you to be able to create multiple instances of the filter and bind them to different places, and I'll show you that in a second. The filter is dead simple. Time the request. Update the stats. Oh, wow. Sorry about that. That slide has some kind of shadowing on it, which makes it nearly unreadable. But that's okay. You guys have seen filter uh, declarations before, right? Servlet request stats. Uh, and then I jam the other one together. JSP request stats. I'm calling this one, serv name is servlets. And down here I'm calling it, I'm sure it's JSP. Yeah, we'll just call it JSP. Yeah, JSP stars at the end. Yeah, all right. And then. Uh, Second to last line on the right side. <laughs> Way down there. Yeah. All right. So, and then for the servlets one, I map it to uh, anything with servlets. I, I'm, I'm, I'm being very uh, crass here and just mapping it to a huge list of things. If you wanted to keep metrics about a specific, uh, a specific URL, you could, you could map it to any arbitrary pattern. You can also map it to multiple patterns. So if you had um, little re the little requests and the big requests filter, you could do it that way. So check it. JSPs, servlets, processing time and request count. The system works. So uh, I put a little bit of load on it just to get the numbers up from zero. Um, that's uh, exciting. And then, of course, there's our reset counters operation. And oh, I don't have a slide, but trust me, they all return to zero. So anybody use? J console in production to monitor their software. No, good. Um, it's because it doesn't really work. Um, first of all, if you are lucky enough to have a one box wonder, uh, you, could you could monitor it that way. But remote access is a pain in the neck. The ports are jumping all over the place. Tomcat has some tools to allow you to fix those ports. But let's just forget about that altogether. Instead, let's use better tools. Yes. Oh, OK. Um, so let's use Nagios. Most people know what it is. It's free. It's widely deployed. ASF uses it. There's proof right there. Um, and so uh, Nagios can monitor arbitrary things. Tomcat can expose its data via JMX. Let's marry them together and see what we can get done. So Nagios has a plug-in architecture, which basically means it's a fancy way of saying it can run any script. And there are freely available plugins for JMX. There's one called Check JMX. So you have to have this magically disgusting URL to get connected. But once you're in there, you can say, this is the object in which I'm interested. This is the non-heap memory usage. And specifically, I'm interested in the used memory. How much memory am I actually using in my non-heap memory? It's going to warn if it's more than this number of bytes. It's going to get really angry if it's more than that number of bytes. And if I actually run this command, it will give me a warning, and say, and which says that I'm somewhere between the warning and the critical level. There it is. So there's some caveats with uh, check JMX. Think about how many values you might want to monitor in a particular running server. It's likely to be greater than one. And if you want to spin up. 20 or 30 JVMs once every three or five minutes on your server, go right ahead, but you're probably going to trip a load alarm at some point saying that you are using a lot of the CPU to do that. So there's actually an alternative option. Tomcat uh, has a manager web app, which has a JMX proxy servlet. It's basically, you can make JMX requests via HTTP. So uh, and you can also use Tomcat's authentication tools, which is nice. Um, if you use 
Uh, if you try to connect remotely using JConsole, it's going to ask you for a, a username and password. I don't think it can get more complicated than that. Tomcat can do anything. It can tie into your Active Directory implementation to make sure that you and five of your admins can all log in and do this, but nobody else can. Um, so CheckJMX proxy is a little Perl script that I wrote, and I'm really sorry about that. Uh, Boy, that looks terrible. <laughs> I'm really sorry about that shadow. Ch Check JMX proxy is a little Perl script that I wrote that can communicate with Tom through Tomcat's JMX proxy servlet and give you an Agios friendly output. So it's essentially a drop in replacement for Check JMX, except the URLs are a whole lot easier to understand and you don't have to worry about uh, ports jumping around on you. Well, you could expose it. What I choose to do usually is uh, I use NRPE, which uh, allows you to have, uh, so Nagios is over here, your server is here, Nagios makes a remote connection to the local thing, and then it's a, a local check of the JMX stuff. Uh, I'll, I'd be happy to explain that a little later. Um, but uh, you could connect directly to it if you chose to. So here's a screenshot of some values uh, from my, one of my production systems. Uh, it gives you, this is the raw output that's coming from each of those check JMX proxy things. Uh, I'll talk about the out of memory error a little bit later because it's kind of interesting. So here's some stupid JMX command line tricks. We have on our software a user object in the session. And so with a little bit of bash foo, I can fetch through the manager, uh, through the JMX proxy servlet, I am calling this operation list session IDs, and I'm looping through all of them, and then I am making another request for each one and saying, give me this session ID's user attribute. And that will dump out all of the names of the users who are currently logged into one particular Tomcat instance. Um, I actually did this recently because we had a huge spike in sessions and I said, who the hell is logged in and why? And I found out that uh, something had happened and uh, we ended up having a lot of sessions that had no users associated with them. So no problem, I did something like this and just expired all of the sessions that didn't have a user associated with them. So what about data that changes over time? Uh, or rather, not changes over time, but the rate of change is more interesting than the actual current value. So you want to look at um, used memory. You might want to just make sure that you don't exceed a 100 megabyte heap or a 5 gigabyte heap or whatever it is. Uh, there are some other things that, uh, that lend themselves to looking at deltas instead, like a session count or uh, request errors or something like that. So uh, check JMX proxy has some of those capabilities. What you can do is uh, you can give it two arguments. You can give it this write command, which says, uh, or rather argument, that says whatever value you fetch from the server, drop it into this file. And then you can give it this, this compare argument, which says uh, look at this file and compare it to the number that you just grabbed. So if we execute this command three times in a row, uh, looking at the heap memory used, uh, the first delta doesn't matter because it's the first time I ran it. Second delta says, I am now using 11 more megabytes. This must have been during some kind of load scenario. <clears throat> uh, and then I, I run it a second time, and uh, I'm using slightly less memory this time than I was before. Actually, yes, that's negative, in case you can't see. Um, so a GC has occurred, and my used memory has gone down. So again, there's lots of data that's, whose rate of change is more interesting than its current value. Um, <clears throat> Tomcat provides, I think I mentioned this earlier, a session create rate for sessions. Uh, and here's how to get request errors. Really sorry about the display of this thing. So here's the write to the errors.txt. Compare also against errors.txt. And it says that uh, the error count is currently zero and the delta is zero. Fantastic.
So the number one question that I hear about monitoring a JVM instance is, how do I detect an out of memory error? Um, the answer is usually complicated. So let's talk about it. <laughs> um, sorry? Uh, I, for, honestly, uh, rarely does anybody say, I saw a big stack trace on my console screen. What they usually say is, my server is acting funny. And I went back to, and looked in the logs, and like three hours ago, we had an out of memory error. That's the problem. The problem is not that your server is out of memory. The problem is that it took you a long time to figure out that your server was out of memory. Things are acting funny, and you don't know why. And if you get particularly unlucky, your, the log in the log file will just say, OOME, nothing. No stack trace, no nothing. So when you're like, you know, pounding the B button on less, looking for the problem that occurred, it just goes right by. So there's a bunch of ways that you can get out of memory error. Let's talk about heap exhaustion because that's usually what happens. Sorry. Uh, so there's two type of heap exhaustions. Um, one is recoverable and one is not really recoverable. Um, and frankly, it really doesn't matter why it happened, but you just want to know about it. So you can make the determination as to whether or not you need to bounce your server immediately, or if you can wait until off hours or something like that, or you have to play games with your load balancer, whatever, you have lots of options. The important part is you want to be notified. So back to java.lang. We looked at memory before. Now we're going to look at memory pool. Each memory pool, including permgen, one to look at, and the old gen, which is a 10-year generation. Uh, I don't know if you really care to look at the Eden space and the survivor space, but I suppose you could. Um, so all that information is exposed here. You can see the current usage, and uh, there are a number of threshold values that you can set. So I'm specifically looking at these. They all default to zero. So if, the mem if you set this usage threshold, which happens to be blue, I think it's probably blue because you can change it. Um, if you set that threshold to some value in bytes, if the memory usage exceeds that threshold, the JVM will increment this usage threshold count. It's more like a usage threshold exceeded count or something like that. Um, and it will flip the threshold exceeded attribute value here from false to true. So I've expanded the, uh, the heat memory usage there. And for whatever reason, I switched from perm gen to old gen. Uh, and what I've done is I have set a usage threshold here, which I am guaranteeing is going to be exceeded before GC kicks in. So I'm going to rerun my uh, JMeter load test from earlier, which is really not a load test, but just generates a whole lot of garbage. And what you can see is that the threshold count has gone from 0 to 2. That's because it exceeded it once, GC occurred, I exceeded it a second time. Now, notice that it says usage threshold exceeded is false. Why is that false? That will only be true when the threshold is currently being exceeded. It's not a one way, once it's been exceeded, it's true and it stays that way forever. It'll tell you if it's currently being exceeded. So if GC kicks in, the usage goes below the threshold, that then drops back to false. And <clears throat> take a look at this. Uh, this is a, a tab that I haven't shown before, is the notifications. Uh, J Console is nice enough to tell me that there are new notifications. Um, I don't know why I didn't catch the first one, but I caught the second one. Um, I can actually inspect that and get lots of great information about when and why and how my memory usage was uh, exceeded. So I have some options for how to detect these things. Polling doesn't seem like a great idea. You want to know right away. So what about these notifications? Um, all you have to do is register a notification listener from within Java and then have that listener take some action. So, no problem. Step one, step two, step three, step four, step five, step six. Yes? So the notification listener is against the application's running or is that the 
Uh, well, it's, in this, it's inside the JVM that you're trying to monitor. Correct. You could do it at the server level. Uh, the question is how to modify the defaults for the thresholds. Um, what you will have to do is when your server starts up, you will have to grab that mbean and poke them in. I don't believe you can, but I, honestly, I didn't do too much research into it. Um, and I'll tell you why in a second. So all you have to do is, and here you go. This sort of answers your question. Set the threshold on startup. Register a notification listener. Watch the exceeded count. Pull it. Report to monitoring software. Repeat for each memory pool you want to watch. Hope the JVM doesn't bone while it is trying to perform the notification, which, by the way, is happening because you ran out of memory. Um, and this is insane. Let's clear the table. There's got to be an easier way to do this. Turns out JVM does have an easier way. From my extensive field research and mostly anecdotal evidence, on out of memory error running a script when this happens is the most reliable way to get notification of an out of memory error occurring. Um, sadly, JAMX is probably not the answer for this. So don't do it. Uh, instead, uh, you can use a command to notify Nagio. <clears throat> so you could write a script that, that wraps curl. If you send all of this stuff to your Nagios instance, you can poke what's called a passive check into Nagios. Uh, and so what you do is you tell, you tell Nagios, I'm interested in out of memory errors, but instead of polling every five minutes to find out if I've run out of memory, just sit and wait to be told whether you have run out of memory or not. Um, for those who actually have set up Nagios, might be interesting to note that you should disable flap detection and set it up as a passive check only. If you don't disable flap detection, the moment that you tell the server that you've got an out of memory error, it will immediately tell you that it's flapping and it will be very helpful and not notify you. The question was, is this option on out of memory error available in uh, Java 1.7 patch level 51? Uh, it is definitely in there. I can't imagine it disappearing for Java 8. However, I did not specifically check. Does anybody happen to know the answer to that question? Yeah, I, I don't see that thing going anywhere. In fact, it's only gotten better over time as far as I can tell. Oh, uh, and I did want to mention that um, if you're going to do this type of thing, <clears throat> everybody's using authentication on their monitoring host, of course, right? So don't execute this command. Instead, wrap it in a script, put your authentication information into the script, change the file permissions correctly. <laughs> don't let anyone get access to your monitoring server. So brief summary, um, JMX provides lots and lots of information. Uh, and it's mostly, uh, JMX itself does not provide this information. It's the JVM that's publishing it through this technique. Tomcat has a huge amount of information that you can inspect, and you, as an application developer, can choose to expose anything that you would like to through the same technology. Uh, you have plenty of tools at your disposal, not just the ones that come out of the box with uh, uh, with your JVM or your profiler, uh, but also some tools that uh, the community has developed, and um, uh, you're free to use those. Um, so if anybody would like to take a look at the slides, I will write that down since it's not legible. Um, they'll be, uh, they're on people.apache.org. Uh, my last name is Schultz, S-C-H-U-L-T-Z. You can find it in, in there under ApacheCon 2014. Um, there's a, the passive check for Nagios. There's CheckJMX. These are both in the Tomcat wiki. And special thanks to Christopher Blunk because he provided all the information about how to write an mbean, um, which is not always the most straightforward thing in the world. So I'd be happy to answer any questions that you guys might have. Okay. What tools are used for config monitor? We have Nagios running. So we at my customer, we are deploying, sorry, 
Um, I was missing a reference, basically. So what we are deploying for each web server we have in Tomcat is a tool called Java Melody, hmm. which gives you a lot of information. And this is really helpful if you know about Java Melody. So the question is, are you using Java Melody, or is it not good enough for you? So uh, the, the answer is, I'm not using Java Melody. It is not because it is not good for me, uh, good enough for me. Um, right now, uh, and something that I didn't mention is a lot of this is a work in progress for me. I'm, I'm kind of a DevOps CTO, so I get to play every role, which is a lot of fun. And so I am not monitoring right now thousands of servers, and I'm not monitoring uh, thousands of data points or millions of data points or anything like that. Uh, so this is sufficient for my work uh, as it stands now. Um, using a tool like uh, Java Melody, there's also uh, Mosquito and uh, uh, Jolokia. They can do all of these types of things. Uh, those are additional tools that you could use. I didn't want to get into the complexities of setting those up or configuring them or anything during this presentation. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, so you're you're more than welcome to uh, to use a tool like that. Um, you can, Java or uh, Melody and, and other tools can also consume this type of information for, from JMX. So particularly when it comes to um, uh, publishing information about your own application. So Melody, I'm sure, already knows how to watch Tomcat and make sure Tomcat is doing OK. But it may not know how to watch your application. So you'll have to teach it how to do that. And you can use the JMX tools to do that. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. What's the uh, overhead on doing this? Can I do 1,000 checks every five seconds? or I mean. Uh, I didn't do too much load testing. Um, the, the, the JMX proxy servlet is pretty bare bones. Um, it fetches an mbean. That's in memory. It looks up an attribute, and it, and it dumps the value out. Uh, the, uh, the, the payloads in both directions are very small. Uh, you're not talking. It's not like a, um, it's not like a, a SOAP request or anything complicated like that. Mark has a comment, which I'm sure is directly related. <laughs> it is. Um, the, by far the biggest performance impact when you do that is the cost of running the method that's generating the return value. If it's a simple lookup, it'll be trivial. If you're actually doing quite a bit of processing, then that'll cost you it. So it's much more, the cost is really all the variable, but is in the, the cost of executing the method that returns the value. The question was, was whether or not the, the, the methods are locked or atomic. Uh, those, those that should be, should be. <laughs> and those that, uh, that, those that aren't, you might have to watch out for. There was a Google Summer of Code project a few years ago that was meant to go through and make everything read-only that should be read-only and make everything safe to change that was changeable. It didn't really complete that successfully. So generally, if somebody points out a problem with the JMX, we'll fix it, but we might not fix it the way you like. We might just make it read-only instead. Be careful what you wish for. Any other questions? I actually have a, 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 com a follow-on comment to that. I had considered for this presentation uh, writing a more complicated uh, statistics bean that would, take, that would keep historical information, and then you could call it up and ask things like, what is the five-minute response time average? What is the 10-minute response time average? What is the one-minute response time average? That kind of thing. But I didn't want to get into long-running methods, having to make defensive copies of things in order to take a snapshot as quickly as possible and then running through all those things. So, um, Apache stats. Sorry? There's a common stats project that's good for that. Oh, OK. Perfect. Yeah, so David's comment for the recording was that uh, uh, you said it was Apache Stats. Yeah, it's like Commons, com it's a Commons project com for stats. Commons yeah. Stats. Yeah, there's like a descriptive, descriptive statistics uh, collector. By default, holds like 2,000 samples. Oh, OK, so it can do all the heavy lifting for right, you, and yeah, then you just shove just the values out. I mean to expose it. OK, great. Yes? Yeah, one comment along the line. There is a cool project called Java Simon, which does basically this out of the box with just wiring WebXML and the Java L again. So you get most of the stuff with ready-to-use ready tools. Yeah. I mean, so 
we wrote uh, we wrote something similar just in Tommy, and that was like one class. So it, it, it's not ex you, tools are great, but one Java class is not so horrific. And then you can just wire it up, just like Chris was showing against the URL or whatever you want to do. Sure. So this this was not meant to be it. a terribly practical example. It was more like if I want to do this, how do I how do I write the code? Uh, what are the steps necessary? So obviously, you could wire this in. If, if you had a component like Apache a Commons stat statistics package or something that can handle the stats for you, you just have to wire it into uh, JMX through a bean. Or if you have a, a, another component that already yeah. bespeaks JMX, you could certainly use that. Anyone else have any questions? All right. Well, thanks a lot for coming. So, so on my on my screen, it doesn't look this bad, <laughs> um, and uh, and I, I do remember seeing that in there and, and trying to turn off the, the shadow, and I, I couldn't figure out how to do it. So I just said uh, it doesn't look that bad, but but up on the screen, uh, for whatever reason, it, it's amplified. So you'll you'll be able to read them. I I, I promise. Okay. Thank you very much. Chris. All right. Thanks, everybody.